Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page, and please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Dennis O'Shea about balancing virtual work, digital security, and employee experience in the workplace. Dennis O'Shea, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you, John. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, it is a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from Tennessee. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. Today, we're going to be talking about a recent report out of your company uh, that looks at virtual work and the nature of work as it's shifting specifically and especially for younger generations. So we'll be talking about balancing virtual work with organizational data security and balancing all of that with employee experience so that we can attract and retain great people. As we get started, I wanted to share Dennis's bio with everybody. Dennis O'Shea founded Mobile Mentor in New Zealand in 2004. Since then, the company has helped millions of people unlock the full potential of their technology. In 2017, he moved to Nashville, Tennessee to launch the company's U.S. business with a focus on securing the mobile workforce in industries such as healthcare, education, finance, and government services. And I could go on and on, but I'll pause there and give you a chance now, Dennis, to share with listeners uh, anything else about yourself, your background, and then we'll launch on into the conversation. I think you nailed it, Jonathan. The bio was uh, short and succinct and and pretty good, so I suggest we, we get into it. Okay, so tell us about this study. Um, what was the driver behind the study? Uh, tell us a little bit about the methodology, uh, and then we can start to dig into some of the, the findings and outcomes. We were really curious to understand how people are actually working as we come out of the pandemic, because it was clear that a, a number of mega changes had happened during the pandemic. And if we think about the way people used to go to work, they used to drive to a location log into a a machine owned by their company, work for eight or nine hours, log out and go home and leave it behind. And then five big things happened in two short years. And those five things were, first we were told, go home and figure out how to work remotely. And then we saw a 500% increase in cyber and hacks and breaches and all that, in particular going after our schools and our hospitals and government institutions. And then the third thing we saw happen was this crazy global chip shortage. And what that meant was that in 2020, when we thought we were coming out of the pandemic, and organizations started hiring again, they couldn't even supply a laptop or a desktop to their employees. So they had to enable people to do BYO laptop, you know, bring your own laptop or desktop for the first time in history. And then, of course, we saw the great resignation happen where, and we see that as really a power shift between employers and employees, where for an employee, changing jobs was as simple as saying, I can put my current laptop in a, in a FedEx bag or UPS bag and ship it off. And I can open another bag and take off my new laptop. I can sit on the same seat, connect to the same monitors on my desk, connect to the same Wi-Fi in my home, and I've got a new job. And so the barrier to change was extremely low. And we were really interested to understand how is all this impacting people and how are organizations protecting themselves and, and not getting hacked? And how are they attracting and retaining people to work in this very dynamic new environment? So that was the motivation for the research. Great. Yeah. And it's super important. As you said, we, we've seen tremendous shifts over the last couple of years. We've talked a lot about what some of those shifts are and the drivers behind those shifts on previous episodes of this podcast. I'm sure we, we might touch on it a little bit more, but why don't you now tell us a little bit more about uh, the methodology behind this research? Uh, and then we can talk about findings. 
Sure. So we picked on four highly regulated industries that really should have their house in order when it comes to security and, and employee engagement. So it's finance, education, healthcare, and government. So they all have to protect something, a patient record, a healthcare, you know, a student record, something. And we did a, a survey in, in the USA and Australia. So a thousand people in the USA, all frontline workers in those four industries and 500 people in Australia. So what's interesting from the data was the two countries, the data from the two countries was really, really similar. There were some differences between the industries, but actually very little difference between the countries. And we're going to repeat the study every year for the next four years and expand the geographies, maybe to the UK, New Zealand, other countries, um, to see are there differences between countries. But we were amazed to see that the challenges that organizations face in the US and Australia, almost identical, but vary somewhat between the industries. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just say that that is consistent with my own research. I, I, I'm an academic, so, you know, I, I, um, I teach at the university. I do research in this space and have been for the last 15 or so years. Um, and so my comparative international research around these types of issues and the nature of work and employee motivation, engagement, satisfaction, those sorts of things, uh, I found consistently over the last couple of decades, some, uh, predominantly very similar um, outcomes and predictors and drivers in the U.S. and Australia. Um, so, so that's interesting and good to hear that yeah. that's holding consistent uh, and is kind of not a replication, but a, an, a, an extension of, of some of the other research that's out there. So that's fantastic. I think that just speaks to the, the credibility of, and the reliability of the data and the research that you've conducted. So that's wonderful. Um, so we know things have been shifting um, we know, despite obviously geographical location differences that, you know, there's lots of cultural different or cultural similarities, um, between Australia and the U S, um, but also differences. And there's, lots of differences too. there's, there's all sorts of differences in terms of macroeconomic, geopolitical and, and that kind of stuff. Right. So it's interesting. Australia, in my mind has always been one of those that was a little bit fuzzy in my mind. Why, why is it so similar? To the U.S., despite some of these other macro contextual conditions being quite different, I mean, still probably more similar than, say, a Southeast Asian country, you know, like Indonesia or something. Uh, but, but why, when we have a country that is quite different, why do we see so many similarities? Do you think? I think some of it is technology driven. And this was one of the, the reasons we were so interested in, in studying this. When you think about all those millions of people who are now working in, in home offices and engaging with their companies remotely, and that's happening across all industries, the relationship with their company is through a very standard set of technologies. So most people have a Windows laptop or a MacBook on their desk. They're probably running Microsoft Office 365 software. They're using Outlook and Teams or Zoom. We're, we're actually all using a very similar set of technologies through which we communicate with our colleagues and our customers and our partners and suppliers and all that. So that's a great leveler. That's a great common denominator across all of us. And we think about that relationship and how people engage, how people experience the technology provided to them by their company. And that can be a horrible experience that will create one set of employee um, uh, reactions, or it can be a fantastic experience where the person is secure, is empowered with good technology, is happy. And, and, and really that relationship with the technology will define the employee's productivity and, and satisfaction with, with their company in that remote setting. And as we, as we think about this hybrid workforce now where people might be in the office a couple of days a week, they might be at home a couple of days a week, they're starting to travel again, then suddenly the importance of that technology goes up another level because you want to be able to have the same productivity wherever you are and be secure and be able to be effective anywhere you are without too many constraints. So I think a lot of the commonality that we're seeing in our data and you validate what you're seeing in your data is actually driven by the fact that we're all using mass produced products that come out of Apple, Lenovo, Dell, Microsoft, all the rest of it. That's the great leveler. Yeah. And one of the biggest outcomes of the pandemic for many um, service-based 
knowledge economy businesses is just the breaking down of the geographic barriers to employment. And you've already alluded to this, right? That if I'm an employee, all I need is the technology. And then I can literally work. If I'm in, in the right space, I can literally work for any company anywhere, as long as they're willing to let me work virtually, right? Uh, and yeah. so, whereas, you know, there, there's, there's been virtual work for decades, and there's been hybrid work arrangements for forever, you know, but it, the technology has changed to the extent now that it allows a much wider set of people to be able to utilize that. And then, of course, the pandemic kind of forced organizations to go there, even if they weren't comfortable with it or they didn't really want to. Yeah. Um, so now the genie's out of the bottle. We, you know, people know that they can do it and they can be effective. And in many cases, they found they are more productive and more effective yeah. Um, yeah. when they're working remotely or at least some of the time working remotely. Uh, and they know that they, they just need the equipment and then they can work for anyone. And so now, it, it really is a great benefit to organizations who are willing to lean into and embrace the virtual workforce because, you know, I live in the Salt Lake City area. We're a tech hub here. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's called Silicon Slopes. Um, you know, we have lots of unicorns and tech startups, uh, not to the extent of Silicon Valley, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a hub uh, in the U.S. And, and they, they struggle for talent just like everyone else. And yeah. It, they they can either limit their pool of potential candidates to the Salt Lake City metro area or anyone who lives within an hour or so of driving who wants to commute, or they can literally have anyone from anywhere in the world who has the skills to be able to be part of their team. And what do you think most of them are choosing? You know, of course, they're most of them are choosing virtual um, so that they can attract the very best people uh, and and then make it work and carry it for carry the work of the organization forward. And and so many organizations are leaning into that and embracing it, you know, particularly tech companies. Uh, but there are many organizations that are still really resisting it. And many that are really pushing people to all come back to the office, uh, trying to really limit the amount, even if it's hybrid, trying to limit the amount that people can work from home. And I have to admit that I, I kind of shake my head at that. I, I, it's a little bit baffling to me um, seeing, you know, the trends that were already happening pre-pandemic, seeing how fast things were accelerating towards this virtual workspace and the usage of technology, disruptive technologies during the pandemic. Now we're coming out of it. I think companies are going to get left behind and they're going to lose out on the war for talent if they're stuck in this old geographic model of employment. I don't know how, yeah. if, if there's anything in your research that kind of touches on that. There is, there's quite a bit actually. And the way we frame the research is where we're trying to understand the two big weights we see on every employer's shoulders. And the first that we see right now is the battle for talent. You know, everyone's burdened by this challenge, trying to get and retain their people. And the second is everyone's under attack. You know, the, the cyber crime activity that's happening all around us, it's just shocking. And so we dived into this and we wanted to understand what are the, what are the realities of frontline work? In this, in this new paradigm as we come out of the pandemic. And what we found is that um, security is not a frontal lobe day-to-day -day consideration for most employees. It is for the employer. So the people in IT think about it, talk about it all day, every day. They're working on it all the time. But your average person out in the front line of healthcare or education, they're not thinking about security all day, every day. And we asked them questions like, when was the last time you saw a security policy? When was the last time you saw security awareness training? And the answers were quite depressing in that people don't recall, don't remember, don't seem to engage with security messaging. But the really interesting thing was um, people, as in particular younger people, absolutely see privacy policies. And we found there's a really amazing correlation. The younger the worker, the less attention they pay to anything to do with company security or organization security, but the more attention they pay to privacy. And there's a real dichotomy there that we have not resolved, which is that the Gen Z generation share their entire lives on social media, every detail of their lives, including their pet's name, which I'll come back to shortly. Um, they share all this in social media, yet they are the ones who actually read privacy policies. They're cognizant of privacy. So we think one of the great learnings here for employers is um, instead of banging on about security and the corporate security to employees, let's reframe the message and say, hey, John. Our, our job here is to make sure we protect your personal data. So your personal information never gets leaked, never gets sold, never gets ransomed. And we want to do the same for your colleagues and by extension for any students or patients or customers we have, protect the individual data. I've got your attention now because this is personal to you as opposed to talking about corporate security at an abstract level. 
So that was one of the findings. That's interesting to me. I mean, and I don't know this, but, you know, I've seen other research that talks about um, younger millennial and Gen Z individuals, students, or workers, uh, the, the level of distrust in institutions is very high right now. So I wonder if that's part of it um, in, in looking at that dichotomy on both ends. If it's a corporate policy about data security, there are many younger employees. I could, I could think, and, and I know sometimes if I get a little jaded with an organization, I'm like, ah, stick it to the man. I don't care. Like, <laughs> that's not my problem. That's your problem. So I can see that kind of a thing um, playing into it, perhaps that kind of a mentality. But on the other hand, you know, if you're really distrustful of institutions and of, and of uh, governments and of uh, organizations and companies, you're probably going to be more attuned to things like data privacy. I, I was doing some consulting work for a, a local tech company a while back, a couple months ago. And like many companies, they have the, you know, you have to scan in when you go into the building, right? Um, yeah. But they had, a, it was an app on the phone. And so you have to have this app on your phone. When you get there, there's a proximity sensor. It recognizes that you are an employee because you have the app on the phone that's all been validated. And then it just opens up and lets you in. And I talked to some of the younger employees and they said, that literally every day they delete the app when they before they leave work and then they download it again and put it back on their phone right before they go into work because they don't want the company tracking them when they're off company off the clock off off the working hours um, not that the company would but they assume the company would they fear the yeah, company would the and so they're not willing to keep the app on their phone with the potential of them being tracked and so they literally every day add it delete it add it delete it add it delete it um, so that they can, can, uh, you know, they think that that gets rid of that, that, sec- yeah, that yeah. privacy issue, potential privacy issue. Right. And that, that was just so intriguing to me, um, yeah. that, that the distrust of, of a company that they also reportedly said they love, they feel like it's a good company to work for. And yet they also feel that much, that strongly about their privacy, that they're willing to do that every day. It's really interesting because in our research, we found that the trust is really high right now between employees and employers. We actually think it's at an all-time high. And we think it's happened for a couple of reasons. The pandemic has got employers, you know, had for a period of time at least, employers really checking in with their employees, were really invested in the well-being and welfare of their employees. And there was a lot of caring that happened through the pandemic. And and also employers provisioned their employees with technology and set them up to work remotely. It took a little while, but but they did that. And the data from our research shows that 75% of all employees believe their employers are open to new ideas on how to work smarter with technology. And 82% believe their employers really care about the privacy of the employee's data. And yeah, well, that, that is good. It was pre-pandemic. Yeah, no, that's great. But I also wonder, and I, I don't know if this is something you can address with this particular study, but I also wonder, like we're in the midst of the great resignation, the great about reevaluation, the great awakening. My, my suspicion when I hear those numbers is that most of the employees that distrust their organization, that didn't get the technological support they needed during the pandemic, or felt like their company didn't care about them, they've left, right? They, they're part of the great <laughs> resignation and they're, they, yeah. they're going to other places. But those yeah. who have stuck around and stayed with their companies are those that have felt supported, those that have felt validated in the challenges they faced over the last couple of years, those that have had the equipment necessary. I wonder if that plays into it. It does. And look, one of the craziest data points we got from our research was that 71% of Gen Zs believe their uh, believe other organizations are doing a better job with technology and tools than their own employer. 71%. Now, that's their belief. That's their belief. They probably don't know different. And, and that's an important point because Gen Z left the education system and joined their first employer during the pandemic. So it's their first job and they actually don't know any better, but they think they believe the grass is greener in other organizations. And what that means is, is, is quite profound. If organizations look at the behavior of Gen Z and see that they don't read our security policies, They've got more passwords than any other generation, and they're really careless with them. They're driving shadow IT. So the use of tools and technologies and applications that are not part of you know, the company's IT, you could look at that behavior and you could decide we're going to tighten up on them. We're going to 
tighten up the screws and we're going to beat them over the head with security policies and really, you know, add, add some more um, provisions here. And if you do that, there's a high risk that Gen Z will walk. They'll just leave because they think other organizations are doing a better job. A part of the reason for that is Gen Z is the only generation alive with no recollection of 9-11. And I bet you and all your listeners know exactly where you were on the day, what you were doing, who you were with. Gen Z doesn't. They were running around the kitchen in nappies. They had no recollection. And then over the next 20 years, we were all profoundly impacted by 9-11 and all the security came upon us, homeland security, cyber security, airport security. You know, our lives changed because of 9-11. Gen Z was not impacted. They sauntered through the next 20 years, got through their education, and then they joined the workforce during a pandemic. So their world experience up to this point is totally different to us. And now they're coming into the workforce in waves. You know, May every year they're graduating and there's a whole lot of them coming in. And if you're in Australia, it's, it's November and they're coming into the workforce and they're, they're filling the ranks and we need them. You know, we need more nurses. We need more teachers. We need more frontline people. And eventually they'll become managers and leaders. And meanwhile, we're getting a bit older and a bit grayer. And, and, and that Gen Z is going to take over the workforce. So we think uh, how employers respond to Gen Z and embrace them is going to be extremely important extremely important if we get it right we will empower them to go on and do great things if we get it wrong we will we'll alienate them and we'll create a problem like we actually did with the millennials 20 years ago yeah all great points dennis uh, fascinating research i really t- appreciate you taking the time to unpack that with me and i encourage listeners to to reach out and and check out the research more in depth Before we wrap up for today, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can connect with you. Uh, Tell us uh, anything else that you would like to in terms of connecting with your team. uh, And then give us a final word on the topic for today. Sure. So you can connect with me on LinkedIn. It's Dennis. Dennis with one N, Dennis O'Shea. And my company is Mobile Mentor. It's mobile-mentor.com. And we're a managed service provider. And we help organizations get that balance right between security and the employee experience. And if you want to learn more about the research we did, it's on a website called the endpointecosystem.com. So endpoint meaning a device in technical terms. So endpointecosystem.com. All the research is there freely available. You can download reports for healthcare, education, finance, government, and, um, and listen to podcasts like this one on HCI. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Dennis. It's been a pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out and get connected, check out the report. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page. And please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.